host our second keynote speaker, Professor Gareth Donaherty. Before that, I would like to call your attention to a few operational instructions so that we can all have a good experience. Uh, please note that members of the organizing team of the event will be available uh, uh, and can help you with technical issues if necessary. They can, be, they can be identified by their names, starting with critical. Besides, they are using a background image of Fowl's by photographer Cristiano Mascaro. In the extraordinary case of the room closing for technical reasons, we ask you to check your email as we will send you a new link to a backup room. Uh, all panels and talks will be recorded for a strictly uh, academic purposes. If you feel uncomfortable or do not agree with this, we kindly ask you to leave the room by choosing to stay. We understand that you accept these terms. Uh, we also ask uh, that all questions be addressed at the chat at the end of it, uh, each panel or in this case of the, the lecture. Uh, we will open the discussion to the audience. Uh, moderators will select questions and forward them to the speaker. So please, uh, I would like to ask just to keep the questions short and clear, please. Uh, uh, without further ado, I would like to call Professor Luis Rojo, who will introduce Professor Doherty. Professor Rojo, if you please. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, our next keynote speaker, Gareth Doherty. Associate Professor and Director of the Landscape Master Program at the Grand School of Design at Harvard University. Gareth Doherty organized, along with the former Dean Marshall Mostafavi, the 2009 conference, Ecological Urbanism at the GSD, and was also a co-director, co-editor, sorry, of the following book that came out in 2010. This book, a collection of texts and projects and the conference, Ecological Urbanism, belong to a very significant genealogy of steps determined to upgrade ecology and environmental studies out from the specific realm of sciences into planning, infrastructural architecture and design, where, as we know, have become not just fundamental references, but critical, critical tools as well. The line of such genealogy can be traced to a series of very important benchmarks. Landscape Urbanism, the conference organized by, by Charles Walheim in 1997, and its excellent reader published as a book. Critical Ecologies from 2010, and more recently, Projective Ecologies by Chris Reed and uh, Nina Lister from 2020. They all represent a steady yet fast line of critical thinking that has become, since the 1990s, fundamental for the advance of architecture actively retooled by the environmental cri uh, crisis that we face. The process uh, through which ecology has gone from being used as a model to become a metaphor and finally today to be understood as a fundamental medium in our practice. In 2018, Gareth Doherty put together the book Robert uh, Borlemac's Lectures, Landscapes, uh, Landscape of Art and Urbanism, in which he carefully edited 12 lectures delivered by Bourle uh, Max between 1954 and 1986, which uh, he found largely in his office in Rio, the type and paper and with the original uh, site notes. And a year before 2017, he published the book Paradoxes of Green Landscapes of a City State, State which I believe has its origin in his doctoral research and degrees at the Graduate School of Design. Here, Gareth Doherty analyzes the role of landscape, nature, and the environment in a, a strategic place, the kingdom of uh, Bahrain, a desert landscape and an arid climate. And so he does through two very distinct ways. First, introducing the green color as an aesthetic concept and as a cultural construct, for the analysis of the desertic environment and revealing the differences with the conventions and cultural, co and cultural codes of the West. And second, by reclaiming the methodologies of ethnography for a full description of an extended concept of the environment, not limited to the physical reality, but as a complex material, climatic, social, and political system. Finally, he directs the research group uh, at Harvard University's Grand School of Design, the Critical Landscape Design Lab, which certainly introduces 
not just the title, but most probably the scope of the lecture of tonight. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and we're looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Luis, for the very kind introduction. Um, and thank you uh, for having me uh, today. So it's true. I would like to talk about the work of the Critical Landscapes Design Lab, which is a, a new design lab. Well, it's about two years old uh, that we have established at the Graduate School of Design. And my talk is structured around um, sort of the origins of the lab, um, what led to the lab's establishment. And I want to talk about a couple of our, our projects, one that we're just ending and one that we're starting. Um, the lab is described as a space for speculation on people and places. Um, we take a, a people-centered approach to design. Uh, we engage in a myriad of pressing socio-ecological issues across the post-colonial and Islamic worlds where the design disciplines and especially landscape architecture can help us to imagine better futures. Now the lab is based on two questions. The first is how can theoretical educational and design possibilities be expanded and diversified through working in societies where there is no formal landscape architecture discipline, which is, which is actually most of the world. And secondly, how can landscape architecture more sensitively work out, or how can landscape architects more sensitively work outside of their own social contexts with respect and deference for others' values and ways of life? Now, as I mentioned, most of the world don't, doesn't have a professional discipline or a profession of landscape architecture. In fact, this map is even misleading because many of the countries that are colored green on the map may have a professional association of landscape architects, but it may not be fully established as a discipline. What's really obvious from this map is that most of Africa doesn't have landscape architects and yet has some of the most amazing landscapes in the world. We're interested in what we can learn from those landscapes and secondly, how you can practice in those landscapes without importing a sort of Western idea of what landscape architecture should be. Now, as mentioned, I worked uh, on these books and, with, and collaborated with uh, Marina Correa, uh, Guilherme Visniki, who's here as well, and, and, and many others um, on ecological urbanism, which is a book based on Felix Guattari's three ecologies. Now, Guattari tells us that when we think about the future of cities, it's important to think of the environment, social relations and human subjectivity at the same time. Often we separate them out. We have environmental ecologies or human ecology or subjective ecologies, but he says, no, we have to consider them all together. Um, one of the parts of that that I was particularly interested in is the idea of smell and how we might sense the city through, through smell. So the idea of smell being as valid a form of knowledge as the written word. I like to think also of the work of Bertie Marx as almost ecological urbanism. If we're thinking of a, if we're thinking of projects and of a metric of a project as being something that is has the environmental dimension, the human dimension, and the let's say the aesthetic dimension then they really come together in the work of Bernie Marx in, in a really powerful way. In his lectures, he tells us that 
he has an ambition to work in cities. I think it's one of the, the, the great unrealized aspects of his work. But in some of the lectures, he, he sort of fantasizes about the idea of traffic lights being almost like the flowers of, of the city. Many of you probably know this project or have seen it. Touch me, I'm yours, the idea that you can touch a piano, it makes a sound, it becomes music, attracts people. So it attracts a social ecology as such. And one aspect of this project that I was particularly happy with were the exhibitions uh, done alongside with a Marina who, who's here um, in Sao Paulo, um, where we mounted the entire book on the roof of the cultural center of Sao Paulo. It becomes 45 meters long, but it's a way of introducing some of the ideas or introducing the ideas in that book to an audience who might not otherwise have that opportunity. And who we communicate with as designers and academics is a really important question. And how do we, how do we communicate? And this is something that goes to the core of what I want to present to you today. Now, my work on ecological urbanism led me to ask a very simple question, which is if we want to, if Guattari is right and we need to think of the environment, social relations and human subjectivity together, then how do we understand these ecologies? because the methods that we use to understand the city are usually tied to, the to separate disciplines. And I became really interested in ethnography. Now ethnography is when you spend a time, you spend uh, at least a year living in a community, learning language, codes, patterns of behavior, understanding people's understandings of the landscape through an embodied engagement of being in the field. So your whole body becomes engaged in this gathering knowledge. And I did that for a year. I went to live in Bahrain, a small island in the Arabian Peninsula, 20 miles off the coast of Saudi Arabia. And for a year, I walked through that landscape I was interested in the urbanism of landscape, not necessarily landscape urbanism, although obviously it's tied into that, but I was interested in what are the infrastructures that are required to sustain landscape at a whole, you know, in a, in a, at a range of scales. And I chose Bahrain because it's a small nation state in one walkable area. It's about 13 kilometers wide and 45 kilometers long. So it's technically walkable, although the temperature gets quite hot uh, during the summer, although in the winter it's beautiful. So I spent a year walking through Bahrain's landscape and every time uh, I would uh, meet, well, well, one thing I should say is that I went there to study landscape, but when I tried to talk to people in Bahrain about landscape, they had very different ideas of landscape than I had. And I realized that every time I brought up the word landscape, the, in conversation, green was mentioned. I came to realize that Bahrainis understand landscape as the contrast of constructed green to an indigenous beige desert landscape. So it's the biggest change you can make of the desert is to make it green. Here we see the main paradox that I kind of found from my fieldwork. On the left, we see an image, which is an advertisement for a residential development. We don't see a single building in this image. They're selling buildings, but we don't see a single building, but they're sold on the promise of the greenness of the landscape that is gonna be constructed. On the right, we see what was built. And it's, you can see it's not quite as green as, as was promised. And my colleagues tell me that 
today it's much browner even than this image shows because I took that image about nine years ago. Now in Bahrain, the idea of constructing green is considered good for the environment. So when the people build a golf course, they see because it's green, therefore it should be good for the environment. But Bahrain means two seas in Arabic. One sea is the, the Persian Gulf, the sea, and the other sea are freshwater springs that punctuate the land and the seabed. And they used to irrigate date palm groves that line the north and west coasts of the island, spaces like this. These are really, really beautiful, um, uh, incredible uh, spaces that are being lost. But it was in a garden like this, in a date palm grove like this, that I realized that color has memory. There was a developer told me, no, we just cut down the trees, we build houses, and then we plant more trees, and it will look the same. And I realized it's not that simple. There's more to color, there's more to green than meets the eye. SOM developed a master plan for Bahrain. Point number nine was to green the country, literally to green the country. And point number 10 was to promote a sustainable future. And yet from my field work in Bahrain, I estimate that over half the water of the state is used to irrigate green space. And that green space is constructed not for agricultural reasons, not for production of food, but purely for aesthetic reasons, but actually political reasons, economic reasons, because that green is creating value. So I was interested in knowing what are those values and how can we work with green in a way that is more kind, <laughs> let's say, to the environment. This led to a, an interest in color um, and the built environment. I don't know why we don't uh, teach color more uh, in design schools. Um, but everything we design has a color and color helps us to create uh, space and distance. Um, this is where I come from in Ireland. It's a very colorful place. Um, I'm showing these because what I, the point I'm trying to make is that the knowledge that we gain from being from in the field can sometimes be really helpful. <laughs> now, the interest in color led to an interest in light because of course, color and light are intertwined. On the left, we see an image of the Emirates Towers in Dubai. In the, on the right, we see the same towers at night and in the middle, either in the morning or late afternoon, we don't know which. So it's either dawn or dusk. But what these images show is not just that our perceptions of space and distance change in the nighttime, but so do colors. And yet we persist in designing for the daytime, but in the Arabian Peninsula, most public space is used at night. When I sent my book for um, to the, when I was, going to the printer, I realized that actually all the images I used were during the daytime, but most of my field work was done at night because that's when I could walk. <laughs> and yet my disciplinary prejudice led me to imagine most of my field work being done during the daytime. Um, We had a conference uh, a couple of years, well, actually four years ago now, <laughs> um, that explored the idea of designing uh, at night or for the nighttime. The city of Dubai, um, this image was taken during Earth Day. I was on a plane and the plane was taking off and I, just by total chance, but I looked out the window and they suddenly turned off the lights in Dubai. So every year on Earth Day, they turn off the lights and it really brings home how much energy is used in fighting 
the nighttime. And so what I was trying to show here is how spending one year in the field can lead to several, let's say, theoretical interests that arise from that field work. And that um, are each of these is now a project in the in the um, in the critical landscapes lab where we're focusing on the nighttime, on color, and we're just finishing one project and starting another. And these are the two that I'd like to talk about now. So we're just finishing an atlas for a city region, which is a project based in Ireland and the sacred groves and secret parks, which is based on uh, Afro-Brazilian religious spaces. So let me uh, take you through these couple of projects and then we have time for, for questions and discussion. So the Atlas for a City Region is based in the north of Ireland, where I'm from. On the left of this image, we see the Republic of Ireland, and on the right, we see Northern Ireland. On the left, we see the European Union, and on the right, we see the United Kingdom. The border is somewhere in the middle. We're not quite sure exactly where the border is, um, but it's in the middle of the river, but the river splits in two. So we're not quite sure which one is, is the border. But when you're on the ground in, this, in the field, we don't know where the border is either. Well, locals know because we, we grew up there. The only signs that there is a border is when your signal on your mobile phone changes or, 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 uh, or you notice there's a, a preponderance of, of petrol stations on one side. Now, we were approached by a local government in, the, uh, in Northern Ireland to advise them on the potential for uh, a region that straddles both sides of the border. And this is before Brexit took place. These are the mayors from two local governments, one on either side of the border, who came to Harvard and are particularly interested in in the, the satellite image of, of the area. Now, probably I'm sure most of you know, that Brexit uh, is referred to the departure of the, or the exit of the United Kingdom from the European Union, um, a process which sort of formally ended uh, earlier this year. And one of the main worries about this is that the, the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is the only land border with the EU. And people worried about going back to the troubles that, had, that I grew up with and that had defined this region for so long. The concern is that there will be a hard border between the two jurisdictions. We were interested in fieldwork in terms of spending time in the communities, learning languages and so on. But we're also interested in the fields, which are the, this field pattern is very distinctive to the Irish landscape. And yet it's something that's only about 200 years old in this part of Ireland. The fields are bounded by hedgerows, which are the most important ecological corridors in Ireland. Can you hear this video? John Britton, his undertaking duties over, sets off from his pub to potter about in it. So there's a short video I'd like you to um, listen to. It's only about uh, a minute and a half long, but it talks about the sort of informal everyday interactions that we were interested in. John Britton, his undertaking duties over, sets off from his pub to potter about in his garden. And he has to cross the border because his garden is in Britain. A 
apart from the inconvenient access, he's obliged to eat anything he might grow in his garden on the British side of the border because the importation of vegetables into the Irish Republic is strictly prohibited. This is a smuggler. She's on a return trip from Britain into Ireland with quantities of butter, bread and tin food, all of which are cheaper in Ulster. Smuggling is an old tradition around here, and they start them kind of young. So the, the woman with the scarf, she reminds me of my grandmother. And in fact, I grew up in a landscape where we were smugglers. Uh, we used to, at weekends, uh, we would go across the border into Northern Ireland and get food and hide it in the car and take it across the, the, the border. And the point is that the borders divide, but they also enable certain forms of exchange. And one of the reasons that we were approached to do this project based on fieldwork was that the governments were well aware that there are many interactions that don't show up in official statistics. They're aware that the statistics are limiting. So there are many people who live on one side of the border and uh, will use the health system on the other or send their children to school in the other or pay taxes in the other. And so there's this whole uh, cross-border network that we were interested in. So how did we go about that? We had, I teach a course, um, Design Anthropology, now it's renamed Landscape Fieldwork, but we brought 17 students to Ireland to live in farms and villages on both sides of the border for 10 days. Um, the idea is that they would participate in everyday life as much as possible. So they would um, try to experience the everyday interactions across the border that everybody else experiences who lives there. They were joined by another 12 students who were in a design studio that I taught with Professor Neil Kirkwood. They were imagining the future of the region. They were based in Derry, London Derry, which is the capital or of the region, but it is the um, second city of Northern Ireland. But they were working on projects all over the, the region. And we all came together for, for just one night. Uh, these are just some images from the, from the field. We worked in this little lodge in Derry. We had to prepare our students for media interviews because this was actually a highly political project. Um, people saw it as potentially the first step towards a united Ireland. We were in the local media, we were on the radio. This is in my hometown. And we met with local experts as well, planners and architects, academics, with the youth. We had reviews, obviously. <laughs> um, the project was based on three questions. Is there a cross-border region in the Irish Northwest? If there is, how to draw it on a map? And how will that region develop over the next 200 years? So let me briefly uh, try to answer these three questions. So one, is there a cross-border region in the Irish Northwest? Well, we concluded that there is, uh, but we began by looking for evidence. There's a playwright from the region, Brian Friel. He tells us that, you know, you should look for the sounds, the documents, the words and the images that, that, that make us distinctive in some ways. We began by looking at maps. It's interesting that in all the maps we could find of Ireland, and there are many, this region often shows up as something different. Here is an image of Ireland as a mother and child and the region is the space in between them. It's a void. So we constructed books of evidence. So students in the field started to look for evidence of a region. One of them is public transport. There's, the region is seen as so remote that the public transport systems of Ireland and the United Kingdom don't actually extend that far. So we have our own public transport system. 
that crosses the border. These captions are written in our local dialect. Why does the bus I be late? Um, means why is the bus always late? And the answer is, if, it bees, if it's on time, you all would miss it. Um, we looked at the links across the sea with Scotland. Until roads were built in Ireland only about 50 years ago, there was more interaction across the sea than with the rest of Ireland. That's why my accent is closer to Scottish than Irish. The local dialect is actually so distinct that it has been classified as a distinct language. So in order to break the binary of Irish versus English, um, Ulster Scots, which is our local dialect, has been classified as a, as a language, although of course it's highly political too. Um, but here in this region we see called the Lagan district, this is roughly the epicenter of what we might term as a region. Religion is also different in this region. And here we see a map of showing complexion by religion. It's an interesting title from 1911, but we can see that this region has a high proportion of Scots Presbyterians. But having identified a region, and I think few people would disagree with us, the big question is how to draw it on a map on a way that respects political boundaries. We looked at how city regions are represented around the world. Here's just a selection of, of, of maps from, from around Europe. But usually when you represent a region, you draw a boundary. And we didn't think it would be helpful to draw more, boundary, more boundaries or borders. This is what the government had proposed for the region or governments, I should say, because we're dealing with two governments, the government of the United Kingdom and of Ireland. They base this on drive to work distances. But what happens if you don't drive and what happens if you don't have a job, you don't fit into the metrics of this region? Instead, we propose to look at vectors. So what if we think of a region, not just as a, not as a bounded space, but as a space that is made up of everyday interactions. There's something like 40 million interactions across the border every year. This is an example of one farm in Northern Ireland. I don't know how well you can read it on the, on the screen, but basically we, we spent time in one farm with a hundred cows and um, the feed for those cows is imported from some South America, I'm not sure which country, but it comes from South America, maybe Brazil. It lands in the port of Derry, Londonderry in Northern Ireland. It's then taken across the border into the Republic of Ireland where it's processed into animal feed, into particular mix. It's then exported back into Northern Ireland where it's fed to the cows. The cows produce milk. Uh, they're milked by robots. There's two robots that milk 100 cows. Then the milk goes to the local creamery where it's processed into cheese and dried milk. And then they go to the port and they're exported to South Africa. So not alone is the border, does it facilitate you know, local interactions, for want of a better word, but they're also uh, cross-continental, even through one simple farm. So we started to work at ways of representing this region using vectors rather than borders. The color of the project is um, taken from the Ulex Europaeus plant that covers the landscape and flowers in April and May and um, is the only apolitical color that we could find because in Ireland, everything's political and red, we couldn't use orange, green, red, blue, or white. This is an image of Derry, London Derry, the second biggest city in Northern Ireland. On the left, we see the Protestant part of the city and on the right, we see the Catholic part of the city. And it, this division persists to this day. 15 years ago, there was a studio at the Graduate School of Design taught by Martha Schwartz 
there were 12 students and they proposed, I think it was 12 different projects. One of, and all of these projects were published in a booklet and entered the public consciousness. One of them was for, to build a bridge. The student's project was much more elegant than what was built. Uh, but my point is that of the 12 projects, every one of them have been implemented in one way or another. By providing images of the future and making them, putting them into the public domain, we actually uh, inspired things to happen because if we don't imagine the future, we have no hand in shaping it. Various different projects that we um, proposed through the design studio involve a new city for 1.5 million people. It's not so radical an idea. Ireland will population as they predict is going to explode by another 1.5 million people in the next uh, 30 years. And where are they going to live? Because Irish cities are already, are already full. So one proposal is to capitalize on the border, that there are some services that are good on one side and there are other services that are good on the other. So why don't we just celebrate that and work with the field pattern in imagining new forms of living? Climate change is gonna have a bigger impact on the landscape than Brexit is one of the conclusions we made. And this project looks at how the landscape is going to change over the next 30 years. Right now it's very green, but in the next, um, but rainfall is predicted to decline and the temperatures are going to increase, meaning the landscape is gonna be more suitable for citrus fruits than it is for potatoes. And so the field pattern that we saw with the rectangular fields and the, the green grass could in the future be quite different when we adapt to alternative forms of farming. And the final product of this, which is just being printed right now is imagined as an exhibition, not as a, not as a booklet, but as a, an exhibition that can travel across schools and churches and even private homes across the, the region. Our conclusion for the project was that a border is not a line, it is a landscape. And I think this is very critical because once we conceive of the Irish border as not just this line on a map, but if we rethink, rethink, rethink of it as, rethink it as a landscape, then we begin to break the binaries that we establish when we draw a border. When we presented this, uh, there was a diplomat came to me and said, this is diplomacy through drawing. She said, she said I wish I had this when I worked in Saudi Arabia because um, she said she hadn't seen this idea that landscape could have such a political uh, agency. Now, I'm running out of time, and so I'm very quickly going to talk to you about the sacred groves and secret parks, uh, because it has a, a connection to Brazil, and this is a project that we're just beginning. Um, and we began with a conference at the GSD in 2019, uh, sacred groves and secret parks. What do we mean by that? Well, I be became interested in Afro-Brazilian sacred groves, which have their origin in West Africa. But in Brazil, they often function as secret parks within cities because of all the reasons over secrecy um, that, Afro, that, that are associated with Afro-Brazilian religious spaces, which were illegal until I believe the 1960s. We were joined at that conference by Princess Adedoyin, who came from uh, Oshibo, Nigeria. Princess Adedoyin is the keeper of the Oshun sacred grove in uh, Oshibo, which is one of the last remaining sacred groves in West Africa. We also had an exhibition with photographs by Leonardo Fonati, um, amazing 
Brazilian uh, photographer, and Adolfo Zapara, an, an, another uh, amazing photographer from Nigeria. So here on the left, we see an image of the Tejero Fudun Zoo in Salvador, where I've been doing most of my field work. And we can see the Tejero, the sacred grove, surrounded by the city. And yet it, it works as sort of like a secret park within the city. And there are about 2000 of them in Salvador. This is the Oshun Grove that I mentioned. Oops. This is the formal entrance to the grove. Um, this arch of the flying turtle was built after three weeks of meditation on the site. It's a deep form of deep fieldwork. And the Oshun River is a goddess, the goddess Oshun, uh, who flows through the grove. And every year, there is a festival in honor of Oshun, uh, where Oshun is, is fed. I had the great honor of being there for that festival a couple of years ago. And these sculptures are from the new sacred art movement, which um, is a movement um, headed by Susan Wenger, who is the mother of the the adopted mother of the princess. But the whole set of conditions that led to this park or led to this grove being the last remaining sacred grove, but being, um, um, being preserved is something that we're currently looking into. But When enslaved people were brought from West Africa to Brazil, they brought with them indigenous religious practice. We see here the, the numbers of, um, of, there's something like 5 million enslaved people were brought to Brazil from West Africa as a in contrast to 300,000 in the United States. And Salvador, was a center for the slave trade. It's known as the, the Black Rome, uh, partly because of its hilly topography and partly because of the, just the number of uh, Afro-Brazilian spaces that there are. It's the biggest, is it? Um, and it was the original capital of Brazil. And this is the, uh, the Casa de Oshimare, where I've been doing fieldwork in Salvador, the house of the energy of the rainbow and the snake. As you know, uh, entering into trance is one of the key parts of Afro-Brazilian uh, religions. And one wonders about the, um, one wonders about the relationship between space and materiality and trance. Now, as I mentioned, there's about 2,000 of these spaces. Officially, there's 1,300, but unofficially, I'm told, there's about 2,000 is a more realistic figure. And these photographs are by Leonardo Fanati. And um, as one enters the Casa de Oshimare, you're faced with 134 and a half steps that take you up to the main religious space. And I became fascinated as to why there's 134 and a half. Why is there a half step? I mean, you can tell that these steps were, they're all pretty evenly uh, measured. They're probably built by an engineer or, or um, some other professional. And then why is there a half step? I asked many people, why is there a half step? And no one uh, could tell me. <laughs> but um, only when I went to Nigeria did I learn that the half step was a sign of generosity. I was told that if you ask us for a cup of tea, we will ask you for, do you want sugar? And people will say, 
yes, and then uh, you'll be given one and a half spoons of sugar. So it's a symbol of, of generosity. I will conclude with um, just reflecting on remote fieldwork because what we're, I'm involved in right now is a project on uh, fieldwork uh, done virtually. We were going to Salvador last year to do field work just before COVID started. And then obviously we couldn't go. And the students I was traveling with said, no, we still want to do our field work, uh, but we'll do it online. And I was amazed at what could be found online. And um, this year we're doing field work in Nigeria. Um, this is the Bonfim Festival in Salvador. If any of you have been there, it was an amazing event with over a million people wearing white. This is the result of the um, field work last year. On the left, we see the Casa de the, the I'm sorry. On the left, we see the Casa de Yemenja in Salvador. And on the right, there's a, a map of the year within that, uh, within that um, shrine. So we asked students to jump into that image, to describe the world within the image. And that um, led to current fieldwork in Nigeria, where we're beginning to compare the Oshun Sacred Grove with a nearby uh, Nelson Mandela Freedom Park. You can't really see much from these two images, but on the left, we see the traditional sacred grove, which is based on traditional religious knowledge and practice. And on the right, we see a park that was built because the governor of the state felt that every city should have a park, just like Central Park in New York. So a slum was cleared and a park was built. But when we go to that park, there's never anybody in it. It's an example of what the governor felt landscape architecture should be, um, but it's not quite what people want. And maybe I will conclude with these two images. And I'd love uh, to have any questions or feedback. Thank you. I'm not. I'm not sure if I, I'm the one to run this or or is somebody else. Yeah. If you don't mind, the, the idea would be that you uh, moderate. But if you need any help, just call up us. <laughs> We're happy to help. <laughs> yeah. The problem in, in Spain is, is a long time ago, to bedtime. <laughs> These global jokes. Uh, okay. Well, thanks very much for the for the lecture. It was um, it was it was uh, uh, really very interesting to uh, realize what you mean by uh, bringing. Uh, the methodologies of anthropology and, and, and the knowledge of anthropology into into uh, uh, into your work and and I thought by reading the books uh, um, this last uh, days that it was uh, it was more of a, like a like a theoretical uh, 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 explanation of of how do you uh, deal with the work and with the teaching and and. and Mainly with the, with the teaching and of, an understanding of uh, uh, a landscape architecture, but certainly uh, I was very very uh, surprised and very very interested by by the fact that you literally uh, um, you literally uh, 
have um, included within your your uh, uh, methodology of work these uh, idea of uh, putting yourself uh, in the middle of, of the reality that you are uh, researching on. So I, I think that was uh, really very, very uh, uh, interesting. But um, in particular, I'm, I was interesting, uh, I was interested, sorry, on, on, on the issue of the of the North Island and uh, uh, borderline, which I think it's, it's, a, you know, it's a huge uh, political problem on, uh, um, but when described at that scale, it, it, we realize once again that it's, it's, it has all these other layers that uh, are, are the result of the mismanagement of, 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 of this of the political problem per se. But, but the, which are all, in which other occasions have you uh, realized that a political agency of landscape that you were making reference. Did you did you come across that as well? For example, in Bahrain or or mm. yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, in Bahrain, I real it was there that I really realized how political landscape can be, um, because one of the one of the um, one of the peculiar situations in Bahrain is that landscape is green, right? Uh, so it's the it's the contrast with with the with the desert, um, and yet green is associated with resistance to the state. So in Bahrain, the population is, and I, I hate using the, this this um, these metrics um, because they don't fully describe the complexity of the situation. But but basically, um, the population is seventy percent Shia and 30% Sunni Muslim. But the government are, are Sunni. And so you have a situation where the majority of the, of the population may not be supportive of the state. And green is often associated with the Shia and with Iran. And, uh, and it's a very complicated situation where the date palm groves that I loved and spent so much time in are often considered Shia spaces. And so they're associated with villages inhabited by the Shia and they're often associated with resistance to the state. Um, and um, so there's the, 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 there's the chromatic dimension of, of, the, of, the, of the landscape there. Um, and this gets to the heart of a lot of the political struggles in, in, in Bahrain. And I think it, another thing I noticed there was that it's what I described as a chromatic metaphor. So in Bahrain, people would look at one color and think another. So many people said to me, did you know that green is the color of Islam? And Yet when I looked through my notes, who said this to me? It was all. It was never was a never was a Bahraini. Um, but in most countries, green is associated with Islam. But in Bahrain, red is the color of the state, and red is often associated with Sunni Islam. Uh, but it becomes a metaphor for for green, so it becomes so political that uh, green is so political that it becomes red. <laughs> If that makes sense. Um, it's also interesting that in Bahrain you see green associated with the images of the king and the prime minister and deputy prime minister. It's always associated with images of development. So green is seen as a sign of or a symbol of development and a benevolent state. Hey, maybe we'd like to open up to the floor. So if somebody has questions, you can, I think you can ask them directly or, or, or through the chat. But I think you, you sure. feel free to ask directly. I think it would be more natural. Can I make a comment? Yes, please. Go ahead. 
Thank you. Congratulations, Garrett. Uh, I liked a lot your speech and, and I liked uh, mostly your statement when you said that border was not a line, but a landscape. It's something uh, <clears throat> challenging to, to, to help us to imagine the, the potential of the landscape in the sense, because as far as I understood, your approach to, to landscape is, is exploding boundaries, right? So uh, uh, your speech about landscape was, for example, about ethnography, about politics, about religion. And, and for that, I was remembering that maybe some decades ago, uh, landscape was a kind of a small science uh, attached to, to architecture or to urbanism, but connected only to sciences, to, 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 to vegetation, to, to the knowledge of, of green. And, and now uh, it's, it's, it's something bigger and, and with no boundaries to separate from, from another arts and, and sciences. I was remembering the, the semiological uh, diagram that Rosalind Krauss uses in the famous text, Sculpture in the Expanded Field. She tries to define sculpture uh, against architecture and against landscape. So uh, what, what I would like maybe to, to ask you, is, it's not a, a question exactly, but it's more, uh, how do you define landscape in, in the context, in the contemporary context, when uh, we see these explosions of boundaries? So when we think about, uh, uh, as, as Hal Foster puts, the complex art architecture, these expanded fields, how do you define landscape nowadays? That's, um, that's an interesting question because, um, I mean, I, I think we should define, let, let me put it another way. In 19, I think it was 1948, Jeffrey Jellicoe, who was the founding president of the Institute of Landscape Architects, he gave a speech and he said, landscape architecture is not a good name. And, you know, we should strive to find a new name for the discipline. And when we do, it should be a single word and it should be common among all languages. And I like Jellicoe's work, but I would disagree with him on that. You know, I think maybe the answer is to even let go of the word landscape at all. I mean, I think that there are many definitions of landscape and as there are many landscapes, and I'm not sure that one definition uh, is sufficient for them all. Um, but the approach that I take to landscape is one that includes people. And I think that people are often um, left out of discussions on landscape. We're often very sophisticated in knowing about the, uh, let's say the environmental ecology or the technical ecologies, but when it comes to human ecology, that's not something that is often enough factored into the design of landscape. So it's that perspective that I'm sort of taking if that makes sense. There is a, sorry, there is a question by Juan Alejandro. He asks if there is a specific word for landscape in uh, Bahrain. Um, there is, but it doesn't really translate very well. It's Mandar Dabi, um, which translates as, um, has a connotation of translates as natural scenery, but has a connotation of beautiful scenery, but it's not the same thing. So there isn't a word for landscape in Arabic, just as there isn't a word for landscape in the Irish language either, where I grew up. <laughs> so, you know, I think that gets back to the, the question on definition of landscape, because it sometimes, and in many languages, there isn't even a language, uh, a word for landscape. I have a question. Um, your research 
demonstrates the re-signification of the notion of landscape each time it crosses other issues such as politics, religion, Brazilian realities, for example, also have historical layers of different temporalities coexisting and generating multiplicity of information somewhat disconnected due to the process of urbanization. This explosive metropolization process, could you share some of your experiences about the explosive process and the reduction of its urban landscape? Which insights they can maybe provide to the idea of landscape? Hmm, you think about that. It's almost like an exam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. It was my question. <laughs> I don't know if it was clear enough. It's just that we have a very uh, explosive metropolization process and our urban conditions are somewhat a kind of a, a patchwork of temporalities. And sometimes it's very hard to understand it as a, a kind of a, a pattern or even something that you can work with it. Uh, its complexities are very challenging. So since you have uh, shared with us a lot of really interesting thoughts on how, it can, how can you rethink landscape uh, using different kinds of, uh, of lenses. So I was just trying to see if you have some thoughts on, our, our, on this kind of uh, messy and complex urbanization process and it's uh, the, the it's landscape after all <laughs> thank you yeah it's a you know um, you know we, we have a tendency to when we're working with complexity to try to simplify it and I think we need to you know work with complexity and even make it more complicated <laughs> because it's you know we're often dealing with complex situations and they need they deserve complex answers and um, in order to understand the complexity, this is where I believe strongly in the, the role of fieldwork and, and in the role of engaging with the site and with its inhabitants or its future inhabitants. But um, in having the knowledge that we need to be able to intervene. So um, in ex exploding metropolitan situations, I think we are even, they demand uh, even much more engagement in order to understand those processes of urbanization and development. May I Can raise I? a question? What? Go, go you, Leandro, I'll go after you. Okay. Thanks, Gareth, for your presentation. I knew your work, your work, but not really recent research you have shown here. Many of your studies in African culture in Brazil, something that has really become part of, uh, of your everyday life, despite the recent treats, but it's not mm -hmm. worth dealing with here. I'd like to know, Gareth, how you see this kind of realities that you have been studying. Uh, the relationship between the public and the private space, more direct terms called by authors like Hanare, Habermas, or even Milton Santos, for instance, from Brazil, Santos and Alps from Brazil. You know, it's kind of uh, these different realities in, in, in British reality, in Brazilian reality, or in other parts of the, of the world how you can explore this kind of uh, different meanings or different sensations between what's private here, what's public here, what's is the private domain, the counter public here, the public sphere, sphere or, the, or, or the, 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 the private sphere in, in some sense. Uh, I'm not sure I fully heard the question because you were coming in and, 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 and out. Um, is it, um, did you ask me about the, to, to talk about the relationship between public and, and private? Exactly, if you, if you understand some kind of distinction in terms of the direct distinction between um, some practices in public space and private space in this kind of different culture that you have explored in your 
recent research in, in a very different context in Brazil or in the north of the world or in some of you know, this kind of some, some uh, uh, strongly different culture. Mm. I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, you know, it, the notion of public and private, it changes in different situations. And I think, you know, maybe the, in what I presented today, I think the, the sacred groves and secret parks talk about that most. In a way, it's about publicness and secretness as well. And the idea that certain um, uh, practices are have to be performed in secret within the city, and what becomes secret and what what's public. And I mean, it's it's um, incredibly complicated. But one of the things with Tejeros that I find so fascinating is that they're the last green spaces within the city, and under incredible threat. Um, for various reasons, which are over development, um, religious intolerance, and so on and so forth. And yet they perform remarkable ecosystem services for the city. So if we're currently studying their you know, impact on the environment, and these Tejeros are cooler than the cities around them. And... Um, um, and this is one aspect of this research that we're going to be developing uh, over the next few months. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marcos, why don't you go ahead and later on I read the question from Silvia. Okay, thank you, Luis. Um, Gareth, thank you very much for your lecture. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about um, some uh, maybe a specific part of, of your work trying to understand also methodologically uh, how you approach and some of its steps. Um, so you, you definitely show a work that is very empathet empathetic uh, while also curious, sensible, intimate even I would say, right, approach. Um, and my question to you first would be do you, through the field work, as it seems, generate a hypothesis based on a subject that has generated previously curiosity on you? Uh, and then precise your object of research based on this, as it seems, um, or, or what is your process? And then another curios curiosity is uh, connected to um, your uh, approach uh, as a self when you are going to somewhere new, like uh, you do, I assume, when you go to Salvador or Bahrain, or when you go back home, right? So what, change, what changes, because you're very thoughtful, I think, from the way you tell your narrative and what you observe and how you contact and experience things and how you share with us uh, how you, uh, your insights and your reflections on those topics. Is that process very different uh, when you are at, at a new place or when you go back home. So. Uh, thank you, Marcus, for the, the, for the question. Um, the process, you know, the process differs according to the site and, you know, uh, the topic. Um, and also, so do I. <laughs> you know, I also change because you have to. And so I think both parts of your, both questions are sort of related or the answer is sort of related to, to, to both. Um, I grew up in a small village and one of the things I, I didn't talk about was that the first project I ever built was in my village. And um, it came through a very deep connection with everyone. So I knew everybody who lived there. I talked to everybody who lived there. Um, but it wasn't just the villagers, it was also different layers of government. So I went through the local government, the regional government, the national government. And when it came to um, working on other projects, the question is, how do you have that level of intimacy with other sites? And you're right, it's, it's an element of intimacy. You build up an intimacy with the site and with the people who inhabit that site. And intimacy is not something you can just walk in and 
achieve. It's built up over a period of time. And time is not something we always have. So what I presented today was, was um, very different ways of doing field work. Um, in Bahrain, I spent a year, I had time. Right? It's amazing to spend a year with just um, you know, going into a, a totally foreign landscape and having a year to walk through it, observe, and to then, um, and then uh, interpret that because the interpretation is what is most important about your fieldwork. Um, in Salvador, I don't have that luxury. I, you know, I, I, when I get two weeks, I would go to Salvador or, or, or maybe the longest is two months and spend time in the Tejero when I can, uh, no shoes, uh, white clothes, and, and uh, no phone, no notes. Um, and then in Ireland, we kind of subcontracted the field work, right? So it was subcontracted to students. And um, instead of, because one of the things I'm interested in is in how the role of the field worker can be shared among a collective. So rather than one person spending a year, which is not something we can normally do for reasons of time and money and so on, can you have 52 people spending a week each and can that, up, that add up to something equivalent of one person spending a year? In Ireland, we did it with 27. So we did the equivalent of like six months field work. Um, and I think it has some valid validity as a method of working you know, um, being able to, to, to delegate and subcontract your field work. But there's one, there's one complication, which is the interpretation. It still has to be interpreted. And that may, it becomes a lot more complicated when you have more people doing it. So I hope what I've shown is different ways of doing it, but those different methods uh, depend, are very much dependent on the site, on the initial, even the initial research question. And yes, you should have a research question uh, going into the field, uh, um, but you also need to be open to it changing. And for sure it will change and it probably should change um, from your field work because that's the nature of, of, of research and being open to the unexpected happening. You know, there's, a, there's a great description of, of um, the ambition of ethnography to make the strains familiar and the familiar strange. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Silvia Colmenares. Uh, it goes like, yeah, you have presented an amazing ethnographic research report in the offers a redescription of a certain situation, debunking or making visible assumptions about it. Has it come the case that this work uh, has had an impact on the development of certain policy or intervention plan? Thanks, Sylvia. Thank you for the question. Yes, um, well, I, I would like to think so. I mean, the, the Irish example that I just showed um, came about as a maybe a void in a way in the formal planning structures. They realized that the statistics they had um, were all based on official surveys, but didn't account for unofficial cross-border interactions. And um, so we were engaged to fill that void in a way and came up with a plan that is a human ecological approach, perhaps, or a lands I would say a landscape architecture approach because you know, landscape architects are interested in processes of time, um, environmental processes. We're interested in smell and color and texture and form. And usually people think we, we work in gardens, but if we bring that sensibility into a region, um, it actually becomes really, really interesting. And so when we presented this to the governments, they, they were not expecting what we presented them with. And now they want to do phase two. So I hope that is the beginning of a, you know, a certain policy or, or intervention. Um, we also did a similar approach in the Bahamas, which 
um, was complementary, let's say, to official uh, procedures and to official uh, protocols. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, I think one of one of the things I didn't mention was that we often do this field work as a as a complement to to more formal public participation processes. So often public meetings are not representative of, of the public, right? Um, and many studies have shown this. And so what we do is a, another way of, of gauging um, people's um, values and understanding how they interact with the land. Maybe Luis, Luis Rojo, I don't know if you would like to say a few words. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you, uh, Professor Garrett. It was really inspiring. So I think we are heading to the end of our session. Luis? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I just want to thank again, Karen uh, Dougherty, uh, uh, for, for the lecture. It was really amazing and it's going to give us food for thought for a long time. Uh, I have to say that uh, I took this presentation very seriously and, and I read the books and I recommend everybody to read them. It was, it was a great pleasure this last week to go through them. Uh, but, uh, like to another level uh, uh, of, uh, of interest to my, my brain. So anyway, thank you very much. It was, it was great. Thank you. Thank you.